Okay, we're going to start in about half an hour. We had to uh, restart our YouTube feed um, because apparently Grant's music is way too popular with certain people. And so this this is not only a mic test that you guys have to put up with, uh, but it's also encouragement to check out the awesome picture books that are back by the projector, as well as uh, uh, encouragement to talk to the Oakland Public Library, who will be back on, uh, back on that table, issuing library cards, uh, telling you all of the great services they have, as well as to check out the awesome parasites that we have in the lobby. It's going to be great, and uh, we'll hopefully be back in half an hour. Uh, hope you enjoy the show.
make sure that everyone on the mezzanine can actually hear us, but I didn't want to uh, make you all learn something. So uh, the last talk tonight's on snakes, and one of the things that didn't make it into my intro talk for that was that um, the original working title for Snakes on a Plane was Pacific Flight 121. And uh, Samuel L. Jackson said, I signed on for this movie because there are snakes on a plane. You should call it that.
to Nerd Night East Bay number 23. We're just about two years old. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm really excited about tonight. We do have other administrative details besides like birthday celebrations to do. Um, so I'm gonna keep my intro incredibly short and just say, I'll, I'll take a survey. How many of you have been to the Hot Monk in Nevada? So there are a handful of very enthusiastic hens. The rest of you should be ashamed, but you should also go up there soon. And to hear why you should go up there soon, here is Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah, um, and I'm the new co-boss for Nerd Night North Bay, which is at the Hot Monk in the bottom. So that's where it is. Uh, we're just starting uh, October 7th is our first event, uh, Doors at 7. It's just like all the other nerd nights. Uh, the nice thing about this nerd night is that the venue is right next to a giant shopping center where you can go to Costco and Target and BevMo before the talk. And there is ample parking that is free, which is also good. So I uh, highly encourage you to come take a look. It's not as far away as you might think. Uh, it's, it's actually pretty close. Once you get over the bridge, it's about a, a 20 minute drive at the most in horrible traffic or 10 minutes if you speed like I do. So uh, we've got a Facebook page up, we've got a Twitter account and a website, uh, and uh, our, our talk on October 7th is going to be really interesting. We've got three semi-related topics. We're talking about sustainable brewing, including the use of poop in brewing. So if that fascinates you, come, come hear about that. Uh, we're also talking about uh, sustainable culture, sustainable farming, including ancient Andean civilizations uh, who also used to get high as balls and then uh, engrave uh, images of them being high as balls on their pottery. And that ties us into our third topic, the Grateful Dead. Oh, so those are our three topics for our first event. Uh, and uh, so here's our info. You might want to join either the Facebook group or the mailing list. And the reason you want to do that is that we will give you free beer. So if you sign up for uh, either the, the mailing list or for uh, our Facebook site, we're going to be choosing one person per event from each the mailing list and the Facebook, so you can enter twice and win twice. And we will buy your alcohol all night long. So do sign up. Do come on and check us out. Uh, and uh, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. And so I'm going to give a little semi-related talk to the first the first speaker. So I'm going to talk about a brief history of the first old English white dude uh, after whom we named an American Children's Book Award. And our, our next speaker is going to actually talk about the second one. Um, so the first one was John fucking Newberry. So that is a likeness of John Newberry. We don't have any really good engravings or likenesses of him in existence. That's his, his award that people get for having wonderful children's books. Um, and one of the first books that, that he published was this pretty little pocket book, and they would give toys away to the kids with it. And his innovation was really creating books for children that children would actually like. Up until that date, they'd only done children's books that were kind of prescriptive about behavior. Like, uh, don't lie to your parents because they'll beat the crap out of you with a stick. <laughs> so this was a, a real turn in children's literature to actually have stuff that was fun to read. So we had ABC books and, and other things that taught, taught children how to enjoy learning as opposed to beating them over the head with it. Uh, he was a very interesting fellow for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, the, the person who he studied under uh, to learn how to be a bookseller and a printmaker, uh, he, he actually worked under that guy. That guy retired and then he started working under another guy and was we're only working with that guy for a couple of months when he died under mysterious circumstances and then John Newberry married his widow. Oh. <laughs> and again, this is the guy we name a children's book award after. Uh, the other interesting thing that he did was that he figured out cross-marketing, cross-promotion, and that people wanted to buy things other than books in bookstores. So he sold drugs. Yeah. <laughs> this was his most famous uh, sale. It's Dr. James Fever Powder, which was actually responsible for killing one of his friends later in life, which was fascinating. Um, but the, the other thing that he sold that he was really well known for uh, was <laughs> Dr. John Hooper's female pills. <laughs> so this was advertised as curing hysteria, curing that time of the monthly season. Uh, and it actually became known as the first abortion pill uh, and it was used for about a hundred years as an over-the-counter abortion pill 
And again, this is the guy that we named the children's book award after. So John fucking Newberry is a very interesting character. Uh, and to, to talk to us next about the Caldecott Award, we have Sharon McCuller, who's a community relations librarian for Oakland Public Library. And she has chickens in her backyard that are very cute and cuddly. And she's an excellent speaker, and she's going to talk to you next. So well, please welcome Sharon. Hi, everybody. I'm Sharon. So my talk is called Cats, Kids, and Caldecott, A Brief History of the Picture Book. Dog people, I'm sorry. It's going to be cats in this one. Um, so, yeah, sorry. So, starting with this quote by Maurice Stendak, one of the most beloved picture book creators and definitely one of my favorites. Um, I really like his philosophy about picture books and you'll see some of that coming through later in the talk. He was around from 1928 until just a couple years ago, May of 2012. And in his obituary, the New York Times called him the most important children's book artist of the 20th century. So you can agree or disagree with that, but it's probably true. He wrote 21 books. He illustrated more than 80 books. <clears throat> and he had one Caldecott winning book and seven Caldecott honor books. So he did a lot for children's literature. All right, so back to the beginning, way, way, way before Maurice Sendak. We have the very first ever published children's picture book. This book, um, so printing was invented in 1461, and that's when the first book with words and pictures came out. It was another 200 plus years before one came out that was meant for children. So this is called Orbis Sensationalum Pictus, or in English, the world of things obvious to the senses drawn in pictures very descriptive title. Uh, it was originally published in Nuremberg. It was written by a Czech edu educator and its purpose was to teach children's things. Teach children things. It was basically an encyclopedia. Had 150 chapters describing all kinds of things children needed to know. Things like how to brew beer, how to slaughter animals, all of the most important things. So this um, this book was pretty much a bestseller. It was a mega hit. It was published in all kinds of languages all over the world. So up here you can see some of it in English. And um, I have a whole pile of picture books in the back, and I do have like a reproduction of this entire book if you're interested in looking at some of the other things in there. So uh, for the first several hundred years of picture book making, it was all instructional. It was mostly things about the Bible and morals and ethics and values. In um, 1744, Sarah talked about this book a little bit, John Newberry published the first picture book that was intended for amusement and instruction for children. So this is the pretty little pocket book, little pretty pocket book, sorry. Uh, it was republished in America in 1762. It was also a pretty big hit. The illustrations in this one were woodcut as was everything pretty much at this time. Um, so Sarah already told you it came with toys. If you were a boy, you got a ball. If you were a girl, you got a pin cushion. And each of those came with a letter from Jack the Giant Killer as part of the package, which was part of the fun for children part. I also have um, a reproduction of this book in the back that you can check out. Uh, the page I'm showing here is the first known reference to the game of baseball in print, which was in this book. So there are other references to similar games, but this is the first place it was actually called baseball. Next, one of my favorites. Um, so first of all, we have color. So up until the 1930s, color had to be added by hand, and it wasn't very popular to see it in books in general, and certainly not in books for children. But in, 1930, in 1830s, 1835, printing color from wood blocks became more popular. So you got to see things like this, which is Der Struhlepeter. Mm -hmm. I don't speak German. Um, which came out in 1848. It was written by a uh, psychiatrist named Heinrich Hoffmann. And yeah, 
You know what they say about psychiatrists, right? So um, he, it was published originally in England and Germany, and it did get published in other places. He wanted uh, to tell kids lessons in a little bit of a less didactic way. So he thought everything in the past had just been too moralistic and didactic, so he decided to tell these cautionary tales. Um, I like the sort of Edward Scissorhands look of Peter on the cover. Uh, Mark Twain actually brought this book to the United States uh, a, under the title Slavonie Peter. And I do have a copy of this in the back also. It has the German and the English as well as the illustrations that you can check out. My favorite story in this book is, um, uh, you can read it in its poetic form back there, but basically mother tells her son she's going out, he better not suck his thumbs. If he sucks his thumbs, the tailor is going to come and cut his thumbs off. <laughs> So she goes out the door, he immediately sucks his thumbs, this happens. <laughs> Mom comes home and, and the little boy is standing there with no thumbs and she's very, very disappointed in him. <laughs> so that is Slovenly Peter, uh, again, 1848. So we move into the late 19th century, the Victorian era. <laughs> And it's way more common to see color in picture books. We're still mostly retelling old tales or telling sort of moralistic stories. A lot of the images of children, they kind of look like mini adults, which is pretty typical for the Victorian era. These are two of the more uh, notable illustrators and authors from that time. They were both published by a publisher named Edmund Evans in Britain. So we have Walter Crane who published uh, this version of Little Red Riding Hood in 1882. And on the right is Kate Greenaway's A Apple Pie, and that one's actually um, 1886. So these are both late 1800s. Um, Edward, Edmund Evans was a pretty well-known publisher. At the time, the printer and the publisher were kind of one and the same, so you didn't have sort of everything separated. So he would find authors, he would print their materials, he would publish them, and he would sell them. And he pioneered an application of using a photographic process to publish woodblocks. So you got to show off this kind of art in picture books way better. He had one other artist who is very well known, good old Randolph Caldecott. So Randolph Caldecott only lived for, as you can see, 40 years from 1846 to 1886. I think he looks very much like he could be hanging out in Tenescal Alley today. <laughs> was English. He was a writer and an artist. He was pretty sickly as a child and his parents didn't really support his art so he left home pretty young to pursue that and he did a lot of illustrations of books not for children. And at some point he fell in love with the idea of publishing books for kids. So he turned his attention to that. Unfortunately it wasn't long after that that he passed away from heart disease of some sort. Um, but in the meantime, he did put out eight picture books. He did two a year that came out at Christmas time over the course of four years. And they um, were very well known at the time and they remain very well known. I do also have copies of all of those. Actually, they're up here because I stole them out of our library's rare book collection. And so you can only look at them when I'm near you, but you can definitely look at them. You didn't hear that, Kathleen. <laughs> Uh, this Maurice Sendak quote about Caldecott is a favorite of mine. I think it really describes what the picture book is and why Caldecott is so known for it. So he devised an ingenious juxtaposition of pictures and word, a counterpoint that never happened before. Words are left out, but the picture says it. Pictures are left out, but the words say it. In short, it is the invention of the picture book. This is one of his more famous illustrations. Keep your eye, keep your mind on the picture of the man on the horse. You'll see him again in a couple of minutes. But before we get to the man on the horse again, we have the golden age of picture books, the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, at this point, images started really playing a key role in the experience of picture books. These ones, um, just some of the earliest uses of lithography, which is basically how printing worked forevermore until we get to the digital era. 
So uh, William Nicholson's Clever Bill here on the left was 1926. And of course, most of you recognize Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, which was from 1865. They sort of epitomize this era of picture books. And again, you'll notice that these are both British artists and authors. So we're still really in Europe at this point. Then we have millions of cats. Cats here, cats there, cats and kittens everywhere. Hundreds of cats, thousands of cats, millions and billions and trillions of cats. Wanda Gag, of Gog, I always say gag, I don't really know. Um, we're bringing it to America. This is no, this is thought of as basically the first real American picture book. Uh, Wanda Gag actually won the Newbery Honor for this in 1929. It's one of the few picture books to win a Newbery Award, really in history. Um, the Caldecott Award, of course, didn't exist yet, so that wasn't that wasn't an option. She uh, pioneered this sort of double spread and the and, um, words in use with picture in a double spread. And I do also have this one back there where you can look through it. There are a lot of really beautiful uses of that. It's also hand lettered. Her brother did the lettering, so that's all hand lettering, which I think is pretty cool. It's also one of the longest running picture books to still be in print, so it has been in print continuously since it came out in 1928. Now we see the horse again. This is the Caldecott Medal. So the Caldecott Medal, the first year was 1938, so it was awarded to picture books that were published in the previous year was named after Caldecott, who we heard a little bit about. And it's an award that goes to the most distinguished American picture book for children each year, up to and including this year. The award goes to the artist, not the author, if they're two separate people. And it's pretty prestigious, it's pretty important. People care about it a lot, librarians really care about it. Um, but I think, you know, people in general care about it. You recognize the seal, you see it around. So, um, so the award does go to the illustrator, but it is for the most distinguished picture book, so it's not just an award for illustration, it's an award for the merging of the two and for a book that is presented to children in a way that, that works for them. So, now we get to the cats. I thought a fun way to show you sort of the history of the Caldecott, because there are just so many winners and honors, is to show you the cats of Caldecott. So here you can see the very early era of Caldecott books. We're still um, using really just black and white illustration. They kind of have a similar look. In the post-war years, people started yearning for color more. It was still pretty complicated to add color the way printing was done in the US, and it was often um, had to be added by hand after the black and white, so you'll see a lot of books where it's primarily blacks and grays and then maybe a single or two colors added over on top of it. So um, there were a lot of cats in 1951. Don't know why. Good year for cats. Uh, a little later into the 50s and 60s, designers and artists started seeing this picture book thing and they're like, yeah, we kind of want in on that, we could do this. So you start to see a lot uh, of interesting developed developments in how the art and picture books were done, uh, some veering from the sort of classic look and some more artistic designs. You also start to notice as the printing gets a little better that you can actually see things like brush strokes in the art and different, different techniques. Diversity in the illustration, diversity in the styles, and again, plenty of cats. So there weren't a lot of cats in the 70s and 80s, it turns out, but conveniently, I don't have a lot to say about the 70s and 80s, other than that it was my childhood. <laughs> um, but basically, the 70s through the 90s, it's just sort of more of the same. Uh, the, the printing techniques got better, illustrators, designers, artists got more creative about what they could do with picture books, and you start to see a lot more creativity in the format. So for example, the Smoky Night one, you can see there's, you know, painting, but it's over the top of what looks like almost collaged, rumpled paper. You could really show that kind of work in a picture book by this point in time. And then we have the 20th century, and, you know, by this point we can really do a lot with digital technology and printing to make books 
and illustrations really have endless opportunity I love having mr. waffles at the end just from last year because that one was really a children's comic book in a way I mean it was a, it was a full picture book but the style was really comic book it had the only words are in an alien language um, really the pictures really do the job of telling the story I have that one in the back as well along with some of these other ones so that's um, that's some cats so who picks these winners it's a good question um, people like this <laughs> So every year, 15 members of ALSC, which is the Association of Library Service to Children, which is a division of the American Library Association, pick the winner. So seven people are appointed, seven people are elected, and then there's a chair. So this is the committee, the 2015 Randolph Caldecott Award Committee, of which I am a member. So the 2015 committee is looking at books from the 2014 publication year. So right now in my house, I have hundreds and hundreds of picture books, sort of like the Millions of Cat book, but with picture books. And I am looking at them all really, really closely along a certain set of criteria and along with my fellow committee members who you see above here, the ones without the heart around their faces. Uh, and in January, we will meet at the, the midwinter meetings, which are in Chicago this year, which is unpleasant. Um, <laughs> Librarians are cheap. We go where it's inexpensive. And we will basically be locked in a room for three days coming to consensus about what is the most distinguished picture book of this year. There can be only one winner. Uh, there can be honors. And it's up to the committee how many books they feel are distinguished enough to deserve an honor. The whole process is pretty secretive. So we can talk about what books we've liked, even what books are our favorite. But nobody can really ever know what goes on in the discussions what books were nominated, what we're really choosing from. So, pretty intense and pretty exciting. These are just some of the animals I've looked at over the past year so far. Um, sloth, cows, and chicken with arms. <laughs> Arbarks, moose. Um, and of course, there are always cats. So, are we there yet? We're pretty much there. That's basically the end. Um, does anyone have questions? <laughs> yeah. So the question was, she noticed in the picture that the committee is mostly women, and is, has this been an issue? Is there concern that there might be a bias towards books that are more for girls? Is this common? So it's a kind of complicated question. The librarian profession is pretty dominated by women. Um, the committees do look for diversity, and so we have three dudes, which is actually pretty good. Um, we try to find library. We, the American Library Association and ALSC, try to find librarians working in different kinds of libraries in different parts of the country, people of color, women, men, but you also have to have people who are able and willing to attend conferences and all of that. Um, in terms of the second part of the question, is it a concern in terms of picking books that would appeal more to girls? I don't think so. One of the things that's really interesting about being on these committees is you sort of realize the process works. So we have a manual that's about 80 pages long, and we're picking the best book that meets the criteria of this manual over the course of really long and intense discussions. So while every committee may not come to the same conclusion, every committee does come to the right conclusion, if that makes sense. And librarians tend to not think of books as for girls or boys anyhow. At least we do our best not to. <laughs> so, yeah. Is there like any say that children have in the final outcome of the award? <laughs> so is there any say that children have for the outcome of the award? For this award, no. This is not a popularity award, so there are other um, lists that come out and different kinds of awards that are for children to, to have a say in, uh, but this one is really based on distinguished uh, amongst certain criteria. So as long as it appeals to some child between the age of zero and 14, the book qualifies and it can be the most distinguished. Now, committee members may choose to share books with children to see how they work, you know, 
Um, there's a book that I was looking at that I really like that when I shared it with children I realized like a problem that I hadn't noticed just on my own. So children certainly come into play in a way, but they don't have any say in who wins this one. <laughs> Uh, yeah. What's the criteria? What's the criteria? It's a good question. I happen to have it right here. Um, I mean, again, there's a there's a 70 page of definitions and terms and criteria, but the basic criteria in identifying a distinguished American picture book for children defined as illustration, committee members need to consider excellence of execution and the artistic technique employed, excellence of pictorial interpretation of story, theme, or concept appropriateness of style of illustration to the story, theme, or concept, delineation of plot, theme, character, setting, mood, or information through the pictures, excellence of presentation and recognition of a child audience. So that's the, I mean, there's more, but that's, I think the one that matters. <laughs> Two more questions, ah, okay. Do you find that among this committee or previous there's a preference for cats versus dogs. <laughs> <laughs> totally no. In fact, when I was, she asked if there's a preference in this committee or previous committee towards cats versus dogs. When I was trying to find all the cats, I kept finding dogs and be like, no, I'm looking only for cats. No. So there are lots of dogs too, and lots of children, and lots of chickens, and all kinds of things. I just have a preference towards cats, so <laughs> that is why my slideshow has them. Thank you. No problem. One more? Uh, way back there. Uh, kind of a related question. I'm wondering what's the ratio of books that are like have all animal characters versus ones that have like kind of human characters? A uh, question I totally can't answer. What's the ratio of books that have animals versus be, like, human? Only about animals doing things. You know, it's if you know a ratio, Amy. I don't know the ratio, but I know there are, there are significantly more animals than people of color. Well, yeah, that I know too. <laughs> that that is not really the question. Um, <laughs> uh, I, you know, I would say based on the ones I've looked at this year, I would put it at maybe close to 50-50, maybe 60-40 towards animals, but it's, it's not, it's not actually that heavily towards animals. What Amy pointed out is that there are more books with animals than with children of color in them, which is true, which is another whole other talk. Yeah, I can do. One more quick question. I saw someone up top. I feel like I'm ignoring the balcony. No? He started making his way down. I'm not sure. Okay. I don't know who to pick. I'm bad at this. Okay, go. <laughs> okay. I think it must be a hugely political award because once you get that award, you make so much more money off of your illustration. So it must be like, whoa, a huge like political thing in the art world. So she's saying it's a hugely political war. Must be a hugely political award because you make so much money. And I mean, I would say it's as unpolitical as possible in that that is why we are conducting our everything in a cone of secrecy. Um, and we sign all kinds of agreements about, you know, not letting it be a political award. But of course, for the illustrator and the author, even though they're not the one who received the award and the publisher, it does mean big money. And that's that's a piece of why it's it's serious and we take our job so seriously and we really follow the manual and follow the criteria and make sure that everything is totally copacetic. All right. Uh, thanks to Sharon. She's going to be around right there so if there are any uh, last questions you could ask her. You should definitely check out all of the awesome picture books that are in the back uh, near the projector and the camera. You should also talk to our lovely librarians from OPL. Get yourself a library card if you don't already have one. The next talk is going to be on parasites. If you haven't already, we have examples of those parasites in the lobby. Uh, it's, it's awesome. Uh, we'll be back in 15. Bye.
speaker, Kelly Wienersmith, is going to talk about mind controlling parasites. <laughs> so obviously I gathered a bunch of images from science fiction featuring mind controlling parasites. Uh, my first instinct here was to uh, do some kind of analysis of the deeper meaning of this trope in film and television. So you feel like in the 50s there's something about communism, you know, but then you still get this going on in the 80s and even more recently. Uh, and you think, what? I don't know. So it's sort of some sort of assault on American ideals of individualism, you know, your individual agency being co opted, but also there's this element of bodily invasion, which is like some kind of like infectious disease fear or maybe maybe AIDS I don't know um, but I decided not to go that route I wanted to be more positive so I decided to look up a little research on parasites that might be good because we generally think of them as being a negative thing so I'm not an expert on this but I found a few interesting things mistletoe which we think of as being very romantic uh, Christmas time kiss under it and all that business is a parasite it attaches itself to a tree's branches and uh, digs in there and steals the tree's water and nutrients. And it sounds really horrible, but in the end it's really great for an ecosystem uh, for a number of reasons, uh, including uh, many animals depend on the mistletoe for food, birds eat the berries, and the enriched leaf litter when the mistletoe falls um, increases the insect species in the forest, which attracts more bird species. So it's great for biodiversity. Yay, mistletoe. Um, next one I have are cuckoos, which could be considered to be parasites because they lay their eggs in other birds' nests. And then the, when the cuckoo hatches, it competes with the other bird's offspring for survival, for food and all that stuff. Uh, so it's parasitic in that sense, but um, recent research has suggested that it's possible that some nests survive better when they have the cuckoo, the baby cuckoo in there, um, because it might protect them from predators. It um, secretes some kind of stinky secretion that, uh, that apparently keeps away predators. And um, some researchers have found that crow's nests that are invaded by cuckoos survive better than those that aren't. So good work, cuckoo. Um, and lastly, we have, I think they're called helminths. Am I saying that right? Uh, which are parasitic worms that do infect humans. Yeah, grody, right? I mean, <laughs> nobody wants this. But there's been some recent hypothesizing that they may actually be very helpful. Um, they have been found to suppress the immune system, which sounds like a really terrible thing. But scientists, or some scientists now think that maybe they do more sort of like balancing the immune system. And since our hygiene practices have improved over the decades and centuries, and the frequency of these infections with these parasites have decreased, autoimmune diseases have increased significantly. Um, also allergies, things like Crohn's disease and uh, irritable bowel syndrome and all kinds of things that could be caused by an overactive immune response that might have been previously mitigated by this grody parasite. So go get some worms. Yay. Um, some parasites can do good things. They're not all terrible. But sometimes they control your mind and make you go get eaten by predators. And that's what Kelly Meanerson is going to come and talk about. So here's Kelly. So first off, it is pronounced Wienersmith, and I also think that's hilarious. <laughs> it's important to have a sense of humor about everything. All right, so the introduction was awesome because it talked about how parasites can be good. Parasites in this case aren't necessarily good uh, in the examples I'm going to talk about today, but they can teach humans about things that we didn't know about previously, and that can be good for us, even if it's bad for the hosts. So parasites unlike you and I, can't just like stroll or roll over to where they need to get next. Instead, they need to wait until their host eventually does what has to happen for the parasite. Or, if the parasite is particularly clever, the parasite can manipulate the host into doing what it needs to do. And so there are some really cool examples of parasites through the process of natural selection that have been able to manipulate their host into doing some cool stuff. 
And by understanding how parasites are able to do this to their hosts, we can better understand links between the brain, the immune system, and behavior, and maybe we can even understand our own culture a little bit better. So let's start by talking about zombie ants. So this work is done by the absolutely amazing David Hughes at Penn State and his collaborators. And they study uh, an ant that lives up in trees and is infected by a fungus called Ophiocordyceps unilateralis. This fungus is super cool. So when the fungus is ready to do its breeding thing or its reproducing thing, it causes the ants to sort of stumble down out of their tree home. They go down to the leaf litter in the rainforest where they're found. They crawl around in the leaf litter a little bit until they find a sapling. Then they crawl up the sapling to like the northeast side or something, and this is happening at solar noon. They crawl up about 25 centimeters, and then they clamp down around a leaf vein. And by they, I mean they cause the ant's mouth, the mandibles, to clamp down around a leaf vein. And now the fungus makes it so that the ant no longer has control of its mouth. The ant is clamped down there and will stay there for the rest of its life. And, I know, right? Whoa! Whoa! And so, what the Hughes lab has done is they found that if you take this leaf with the ant and you move it down a little bit, the ant and the fungus disappear. And it looks like what's happening is that the predators, that like little tiny spiders that live around on the forest floor, find this like morsel that can't get away and they eat the ant. So that's also bad for the fungus, that's death for the fungus. And if you take the leaf and you move it up a little bit higher, this fungal spore, which is what you see right here, is kind of deformed, it doesn't grow quite right. So it looks like temperature and humidity are bad if you get out of this 25 centimeter zone. Wow. And that blows my mind, right? Because yeah. people, people ask me, like, Hilly, what's 25 centimeters? I'm like, uh, I, don't, yeah, I don't know, but like this fungus, I'm really bad at that kind of stuff, but this fungus by remote control is able to get the ant up to about 25 centimeters. That is super cool to me. Yeah. And so that's awesome, but the parasites have a benefit of millions of years of natural selection. So as I mentioned, the ants bite down around the leaf vein and they leave what's called a death grip. So everything in this system is like epically named. The zombie ants, death grips, you find ant graveyards because they all die in the same places. But anyway, so, so this is a death grip on a fossilized leaf that's 48 million years old. So this, this is a minimum estimate on how long this kind of manipulation has been happening. So 48 million years is a long time for the hand of natural selection to be guiding uh, the fungus along to figure out how to manipulate the host. And so if you were to bring an ant into the lab and say, okay, neuroscientist, make the ant do what the fungus does. Uh -huh. We can't do that. Like we, we don't know how an ant's brain works, even though it's like you'd think it's relatively simple. But this fungus has it figured out, and we don't. And that's because it has had 48 million years. So, Charissa DeBecker and working with a bunch of her collaborators, they're trying to figure out what is the fungus producing, how is the ant brain responding, and they're essentially trying to figure out what this fungus has quote unquote learned over 48 million plus years of evolution with its host. And so maybe we can understand ant behavior by figuring out what the fungus has learned about ant behavior. And so I feel like that's that's cool for the potential to make like leaps and bounds in our understanding of behavior by studying these crazy parasites. Okay. So ant brains, like that's fairly simple. Certainly more complicated creatures can't be manipulated like this. Not so. Woo! All right, so I study trematodes. Uh, the trematode I study is Euhaplorchis californiensis, but I'm kind of lazy, so I call it Euha. It has three hosts in its life cycle. The adults live in the guts of predatory birds. They reproduce sexually. They produce a bunch of eggs that pass with the bird species into the salt marsh where California horn snails get infected. These snails eat the poop to get infected, and as if that's not unfortunate enough, the parasite then goes on to castrate the snail. So the snail will not be producing any more offspring. All of the gonad tissue that would have gone towards producing snails is now making babies, and these snails can live for a long time, and they can produce thousands and thousands, maybe millions of these parasites over their lifetime. And so the parasites are reproducing asexually. When the parasites are ready, they leave the snail, they swim around in the water, and when they encounter a California killifish, they burrow through its skin, and they follow nerves up to the brain, and they hang out on the brain. And in order to complete the life cycle, this fish needs to get eaten by a predatory bird. So in order to facilitate that, the parasites are inducing what we call conspicuous behaviors. So I'll show you those in a second. 
But this is the life cycle, and when they get back into predatory birds, the cycle can start again. So this is, well, all right, I'm gonna ask you what you think this is. So for a little bit of perspective, these are fish eyes. So there's my parasite on here somewhere. Where do you think the parasite is? Brain. Yeah, right, okay, on the brain. I'll be more specific. Can you, uh, so th this is like the brain, where, what, what, have, what on here do you think is the parasite? Black spots. Right, so, so these black spot spots are actually like a, a coating that we think reflects UV radiation so the brain doesn't get mutations. So actually this is kind of a trick question because it's hard to see the brain through all of the parasites. So the parasites, like here is one right here. They're kind of clear ovals with like a white spot. They're, oh no, I love this response. <laughs> It's covering the brain. And so the only spots that you don't find it are like up here and here. And that's because I'm a little bit clumsy and my finger touched the brain and I scooted them off to the side. So they should be there too. Uh, and not only are they covering this brain, but they're like filling this cave. Like this is the space between the brain and the skull. And they're like crowding into the open spaces because there's just like, there's no more room. So there's 1,000 to 8,000 of these parasites on adult killifish brains. And so, yeah, if you're an adult in this population, you're almost certainly infected. I've caught fish that still, like, they had just come out of their egg, they still had a little bit of yolk, and they had, like, 10 and in some cases 100 parasites already. So it's, it's rough being a killifish. So the more parasites that a fish has, the more frequently it does what we call conspicuous behaviors. And these include things like shooting up to the surface of the water real quick, uh, turning around on their back and flipping their silvery bellies up towards the sun, which then reflect light. Uh, and I've got a little bit of a video of what this looks like in the field. So this is a school of fish. This is what my little guys look like, hamming it up for the camera. <laughs> and when you see the school, you see these like flashes of light in the school. And there's going to be a fish who does two of the surfacing behaviors here in a second, uh, where the red arrow is. There's one and there's two. And so it really draws your attention. And it also seems to draw the attention of predatory birds because infected fish are 10 to 30 times more likely to get eaten than uninfected fish. So like, these parasites are really good at what they do. I, I think it's really cool. Uh, and they're kind of cute, right? So, they've got these little eye spots, they're photoreceptors, they really only see like shadows. And if you want to see what these guys look like, this is on the brain, I squished a brain. Uh, and if, if you, if you want to see what they look like when they still have their tails and they're swimming around looking for a host, then go out into the lobby because we have the cell scope folks here and I brought some live parasites and a snail that's like shedding the parasites. Uh, and we also have from Cal Academy some California killifish specimens so you can see all of this out in the lobby. Uh, so anyway, really cute. Uh, move on. Okay, so this is what brains look like when they're sliced through. This is an infected brain. This is an uninfected brain. Uh, the little black dots are parasites that are just packed in around it. And Jenny Shaw and her collaborators looked at brains, and what they saw is that when fish are infected, they respond differently to stress. So when you stress out a fish, they have a very predictable chemical signal in their brain so that you know that they're stressed out. But when these fish are infected, that chemical signal gets really dampened. It's much less pronounced. So we don't exactly know what that means, but we think what's happening is that the parasite is causing the fish to respond inappropriately to stressors like a predatory bird. So it's like the parasite is being like, no, no, chill out, it's not a predator, it's just like a shadow, whatever. <laughs> and, and I've done some work looking at a hormone called cortisol, which we release and fish release when they're stressed out. And it looks like the parasite is also manipulating cortisol levels. But I mentioned that those conspicuous behaviors are done by the fish. Some of those conspicuous behaviors are actually breeding behaviors. And so it looks like the fish is reducing, or the parasite is reducing fish anxiety, but increasing sexual behavior. Like, doesn't that sound like a medication that would be really useful? Right, right, like beer or something. And so, so, so the part of the brain where this stuff is happening is a part of the brain that's fairly well conserved, which, which means that we have a part of the brain similar to what the fish have. And that seems to be what the parasite is manipulating. So my collaborators and I are looking to see if the parasite is producing some compound that reduces anxiety while increasing or maintaining sexual activity uh, in the hope that maybe we can find some sort of chemical that will be useful for treating anxiety. And this is way far in the, you know, in the future. And I think it's super cool just to understand how the parasite is manipulating behavior. But we're wondering if this parasite might have some neuroactive compound we've never seen before. Is the side effect of that drug going to be over sexual? 
I don't know, if we're lucky. Uh, okay, so that's fish. But everybody really wants to know what about humans. And so when people ask what about humans, the perhaps more obvious example is rabies. But rabies, when people get infected, they become really afraid of water. They get a little bit, uh, a little bit aggressive. They become hypersexual. There are actually stories of people who are like furiously masturbating and they're about to die, but they just like can't help themselves. And so the parasite is really weird. But when you have this parasite, it's really obvious, right? And so it's interesting that it manipulates behavior, but you know that someone has it. What's maybe really interesting is if someone's infected by a parasite, it's changing their behavior, and you don't know they have it because it's less obvious, and so it's sort of taking the wheel and you don't really know about it. So there, the, here comes toxoplasmosis. So this is a protozoan parasite that reproduces sexually in cats. So the goal of the parasite is always to get back to the cat where sexual reproduction can happen. So cats, when they're infected, produce what's called oocysts, and these get pooped out either into your litter box or into a garden. So say, for example, the people who let their cats outside, those cats will catch a bird or a rat that's infected, and then they'll produce oocysts, and they'll poop in your garden, and then you'll go to pick your vegetables, and now you have toxoplasmosis. Uh, maybe you can guess how I feel about cats being indoors or outdoors. Uh, so anyway, uh, and this is also why when women are pregnant, you're not supposed to be changing the litter box because you can get infected. Okay, so the oocyst can infect just about any organism. Uh, and humans can get infected either by, like I said, litter box, gardening, blah, blah, blah. But you can also get infected if you eat an animal that's infected. So this parasite is really good at just waiting until it gets a chance to get into a cat. So if it happens to be infecting a pig or a cow and you don't cook that meat through all the way, you can get infected. And this is why France, with their affinity for undercooked meat, has 80% prevalence of this parasite. So 80% of the population is infected by this parasite. Uh, okay, so when the cat eats an animal that's infected, it eats the muscle tissue, it becomes infected. We maybe were hosts at one point, but we're sort of dead ends now. Uh, but animals like rodents are good for completing the life cycle. So let's first talk about how rodents get manipulated. So Joanne Webster has done some awesome work looking at how the parasite is probably manipulating rodents in order to in increase transmission. So what I'm gonna call, or talk about is called fatal feline attraction. So usually when you have a rat, and it smells cat urine, it responds appropriately and freaks out and gets the heck out of that area because there's a predator around. But when they're infected, not only do they not leave, but they actually seem to be attracted to that area. And then they slow down, they move a little bit more slowly, and they essentially hang out in areas where risk would be really high for getting eaten. So it looks like the parasite is able to get the, the, uh, the rodents to go to areas of high risk. But what's really cool is that, cool in my, in my opinion, is that the response to other predators stays totally normal. So there's lots of different kinds of predator urine that freak out rodents. It's only cat urine for which the response has changed. So they only approach cat urine. And again, if you were to say to a neuroscientist, whoa, how, how can you do that? Can you change the response to one particular urine smell? Like, do that in the lab. No, no, we don't know how to do that, but this little parasite has figured it out. So again, maybe we can understand how responses to smell work, uh, various other things by understanding this parasite. Additionally, we've recently discovered that the parasite can be passed by sex. We don't know if that can happen in people yet, or maybe I'm just not up to date on that particular bit of literature, but we know that in rodents, when rats mate, males can give it to females. And then she gets it and her pups get it. So from the perspective of a parasite, usually when an organism is sick, they sort of act sick and look sick, and maybe that decreases their likelihood of having a chance to mate. But with toxoplasmosis, females prefer infected males. The parasite is doing something to make these infected males sexy. And the infected males have the same number of offspring, and so from the perspective of mating, being an infected male might not be such a bad deal unless you get eaten by a cat, in which case it's definitely a bad deal. So anyway, uh, this is super interesting. So then, but what you really want to know is about people, and because of ethics, we can't do the kind of controlled experiments that you can do on rodents. And so the best we can do is surveys, and this is the king of surveys in this field. So this guy is Yaroslav Flager, and this is a story that I've heard as being a person in the field. I haven't met him, but Yaroslav one day heard that there's this brain-infecting parasite that changes behavior, and he was like, 
you know, or sorry, this brain infecting parasite. And he's like, you know, I bet that that changes behavior. And you know what? I'm like really weird. Like I don't respond normally, or I don't respond the way most people respond to situations. I wonder if I have it. And he does. And so, so he got the blood test and he, he found out that he has it. And so then he went to the nearest army and was like, okay, I want it to give your army folks uh, these psychology tests. Then I want to draw some blood and figure out if uh, the prevalence of the parasite tells you anything about personality. And what he found was that men who are infected, they have higher testosterone. They're less rule following. They're more jealous. They have different ratios and lengths between their fingers, which is probably because of the testosterone levels. That's a trait tied to testosterone. Where, uh, and then they've also done like outside of army studies on like college students and other people have gotten into this game. And females are more warm, more caring, more nurturing. The females who are infected have lower testosterone than uninfected females. So it's changing a bunch of stuff. And maybe you're thinking, well, that sounds like a lot of like gender stereotype stuff. And so Kevin Lafferty realized that also. And so he said, and this is a professor at University of California, Santa Barbara. So he went and he collected psychology surveys from a bunch of different countries and looked at aggregate country scores. So for example, how neurotic is a particular country? And then he looked at the prevalence of the parasite. And we have pretty good estimates for this because as I mentioned, if you're pregnant, you don't want to be changing the cat litter. So we often draw blood from women and figure out if they're infected or not. Because if you're already infected, you can't give it to your offspring because your immune system is controlling it. But if you're not infected and you become infected when you're pregnant, then your offspring can get it and it causes neurological problems. So often we'll check women to see if they have it and if they don't have it, we tell them to be extra careful. So anyway, we have a pretty good sense of what percent of populations are, are infected based on these surveys. And what he found was that, so this is the national prevalence of the parasite. So these are countries that have a lot of the parasite. And countries that score high on masculine sex roles, so countries where it's important that the man is bringing home the bacon and the woman is at home making dinner, taking care of the kids, they tend to be heavily infected. So there's a correlation here. Additionally, countries that are particularly neurotic have a lot of the parasite. And yeah, these are significant trends. Um, and then countries that uh, are where people don't really like uncertainty and they try to avoid situations where there's some uncertainty about what's going to happen, they're also more likely to be infected. But it is important to note that these are observational studies. So it could be that countries that really care about masculine sex roles are countries that are, for example, eating more raw meat or the women are doing more gardening. And so it could be these psychology traits that are driving the trends in infection and not the other way around. Uh, but it's hard, you will never probably know because you can't do the controlled infections, as I said, but it's interesting to consider that, <laughs> thanks, uh, it's interesting to consider that maybe a parasite is driving uh, cultural differences between various countries. So I've told you about some examples that I particularly like. Uh, I was going to mention briefly the hygiene hypothesis, which was already touched upon. And so there's a lot of different things that the parasite, that parasites are starting to teach us about how our brain works, how our brain interacts with the immune system, and additionally just how the immune system works. And there's a book uh, by Dixon de Pommier called Parasites, People, and Plowshares. And it's all about how parasites can do amazing things to our body and how scientists are trying to figure out how the parasites do those things so we can then use those things as tools for treating human diseases. So these parasites have been just horrible for a really long time. Hopefully we can bring them to some benefit by understanding them better and using the tricks that they've acquired over millions of years of natural selection and evolution to treat human diseases and sort of try to make our lives a little bit better or to try to understand the world that we live in a little bit better. Uh, so real quick, I'm going to plug an event called BotFest. Yeah, yeah, some people excited already. Okay, so BotFest is the Festival of Bad Ad Hoc Hypotheses. Yeah, yeah. So people have submitted their best sort of plausible sounding scientific hypotheses that are actually just absolute rubbish. So uh, for example, the, the, the idea that sort of spawned this was the idea that babies are sort of particularly aerodynamic. They, 
and maybe they're aerodynamic so that you can catapult them long distances because the goal of evolution is to spread your genes far and wide. And so there was a lot of different uh, talks about evidence for this hypothesis, but clearly we all know that that's crazy. And so this is going to be a whole night of people presenting ridiculous hypotheses that sound plausible when given the right evidence uh, and should certainly be hilarious. So our keynote speaker for the night is uh, Matt Inman of The Oatmeal. Uh, and what? we've got six other what? Uh, yeah, no, it's gonna be awesome. So anyway, you you should you should come and you should look for tickets. We're actually selling out pretty quickly. We're pretty excited. Uh, and so yeah, so check it out. Part of the Bay Area Science Festival. Uh, and this is my this is information about my corner of the Wiener Smith Empire. So uh, you can find me on Twitter at Fushmu. Uh, it's a poorly chosen Twitter handle from many years ago. I used to have a blog called Fungulus Schmungulus. I study Fungulus Parvipinus, but anyway, you didn't need to know that. So uh, I also have a science blog called Wiener Smith, and you can find my scientific papers there also. Uh, and I have a podcast with my husband called WeeklyWienerSmith.com. My husband is this orange fellow who doesn't wear his shirt. He does a comic called Saturday Morning Breakfast. Here. Yeah! And so uh, so if you want to come to my corner of the Wienersmith Empire, which is not the comic, uh, then you can you can hang out over here with me. So thank you very much. Questions? Uh, on the trimetoad system that you're studying, it looked like um, the snail and the fish are fairly specific species specific hosts mm -hmm. is that true of the uh, the predatory birds so the question was uh, the snail and the fish are very specific it's just one host species is that also true of the predatory birds and the answer is uh, no so lots of different predatory birds can get infected but it's just California horn snails uh, and California killifish there are other trematode parasites that are able to infect more than one fish species but this one seems to have specialized specifically on killifish, which is maybe not super surprising because they're the most abundant fish out there. So if you had to like take a shot at a fish that you hope you encounter, killifish is probabilistically the one you're going to run into. Yes? So I know ethics are kind of preventing us from doing these kinds of tests oh. on humans. I just frustrating. Um, but what about human analogs? Are there primate studies that are happening or other mammals that are being uh, tested? So uh, the question was, we don't have toxoplasmosis studies in humans, but what about in primates? Uh, so at the moment, most of the research has been focused on rodents. And I think that that's because from an ecological perspective, that's probably more relevant and more interesting because the rodents are going to complete the life cycle, whereas you're less likely to have a primate. Uh, and additionally, uh, this is like, we didn't necessarily talk about all the nastiness of the disease that's associated with brain tumors in some cases and neurological problems in babies. And so I, I think that you probably, I think a lot of people probably would feel squeamish about infecting primates with it. And so I'm sure there's some primate literature. I don't happen to be familiar with it because as an ecologist, I'm focusing on uh, like predator prey interactions. Balcony. Balcony, sorry. Yeah, you. Uh, so two things. How easy is it to test for? And I recently heard that people are scanning, people are dying in motorcycle accidents because they're more prone to have it. So uh, it is fairly easy to scan for. So you, you're not actually finding the parasite when you remove blood, you're finding antibodies to the parasite. So you know that the immune system is responding to its presence. And yes, uh, the parasite seems to change dopaminergic activity. So it's a neurotransmitter of the brain. And we think that that explains the fact that infected individuals are about two and a half times more likely to get in a car accident than uninfected individuals. And so these people aren't like swerving all over the road, obviously infected, but it reduces reaction time just a little bit. So if you're in that situation where you need to make a split second move to get out of the way, if you're infected, you're probably less likely to be able to do it. So yeah, I, that's right. Is there a cure? No, no. So once it's in your brain, there's like, there's not really much you can do. It's really hard to treat stuff that's in your brain uh, because you've got that blood brain barrier. And you know, so you, you're mostly stuck if you're infected, but the immune system usually controls it. It, it becomes a bigger problem if you end up having uh, like HIV or AIDS and your immune system isn't able to respond anymore. So your immune system usually controls it from replicating unless something goes wrong. Uh, another balcony question. Oh, I thought I saw a hand. Never mind. Yeah, on your testosterone-driven country scale, 
What the United States law? Yeah, you know, I, I thought ahead of time, it was a mistake to not label the U.S. or to label like France because we know it has high prevalence and stuff like that. Uh, I don't I don't remember off the top of my head which one was the U.S. Sorry. So that's an excellent question. We we don't know the answer. So there is definitely evidence in our past where we found like human bones in areas where like big cats have been eating. So we have been eaten in the past by big cats that can be infected. But now, not so much. Like it happens pretty much never. Like even the crazy cat ladies are probably not at high risk. So like, so I, I it, it does look like at the moment we're dead end hosts. So a parasite that ends up in us is screwed. Uh, and so maybe it's really fine tuned to things like rodents, and we're just kind of getting the side effects because the parasite is like, oh, I'll give it a shot. I'm hearing. Okay, sorry. The one up there. Question. Up there. Good, good, I'm doing my job. Woo! So glad to hear that. What, um, what percentage of people have it? So the question was... Do we have it? Do you, the question is, do you have it? Uh, <laughs> it's very specific. So without drawing blood, I can't tell you for sure. So, so in the U.S., we're getting really good at screening our meats and making sure that none of the animals that we're bringing out to supermarkets or whatever are infected. So whether you cook it through thoroughly or not, you shouldn't be getting getting infected by toxoplasmosis. Uh, and then for you specifically, do you, you know, do you have a cat who roams outdoors? Do you change a litter box? Do you do some gardening? Good, good. That might be like evolutionarily advantageous to hate cats. <laughs> So yeah, the, the answer is uh, prevalence varies a lot depending on the country and depending on the behaviors. So I don't know if you have it, but you can talk to a medical professional. <laughs> they can tell you. One of your pictures showed a bag of blood that could you could you be infected from a, infected from a blood transfusion? Uh, I think that that used to be more common. I think we know to screen for that now. Uh, but I believe that, yeah, that was a way that you could previously get infected uh, if you happened to be getting blood from someone who had recently been infected, so they still had it circulating in the blood, it hadn't become dormant. So there's a small window of time, and now I think we screen for it. Oh, so it shouldn't happen anymore. And I've been told that I can't answer any more questions, but there are amazing parasites in the lobby, and you can come talk to me out in front of amazing parasites. So thank you. Uh, so again, Kelly's going to be that way, along with lots and lots and lots of parasites. Uh, thanks again to Cellscope, uh, based at UC Berkeley, as well as the California Academy of Sciences, and uh, Santa Barbara for providing some of those specimens. In addition to that, again, Oakland Public Library back there. Our email sign-up list is also back there. If you want to give a talk, sign up and let us know. Also, we only send out two emails a month to remind you to come to cool stuff like this. We're going to be back in 15, so you'll still have plenty of time to check out the books and uh, talk to our speakers.
coming back. Once again, I'm Rick Karnowski, one of the co-bosses of this. We're just about two years old. We'll have to have some awesome anniversary party later. Our last speaker, Kelly, was fantastic. Everyone do a hand. She's also... She was also far too humble, because not only is she involved in um, BawFest, she's involved in other Bay Area Science Festival madness, uh, including an event that we're going to be running that next month. Uh, Keith is going to kill me. For, for some reason, the UCSF uh, media relations people thought that was a really bad idea, so the name of the event is actually the Nerd Night Block Party. Um, however, we're going to have Kelly uh, and the other science sort of podcasters uh, talking to people from a motorcycle hackerspace slash bar it's a fantastic place. The owner is like a jaded ex-chemist. She is like surly. I would lose in a fight to her. Uh, there's going to be game night at the Folsom Street Foundry. Uh, the Phenomenauts, uh, as well as a chiptunes band, and uh, Zeke Cossover, uh, now the Exploratorium, a physics uh, teacher, are going to all be at Slums. Uh, that's where I'm going to be hanging out. If you want to go, you should get tickets now. They're only $15. It's a great bargain. Show up in your nerdiest t-shirt and Kishore and I will hassle you to no end. Uh, we also have uh, Nerd Night Speed Dating at Summit Street Food Park. Um, Nerd Night Field Trips. Uh, <laughs> I, I love this uh, hobby of mine because I gotta do things like wander around Soma, knocking on random doors and asking people, what do you do here? And getting answers like, oh, I'm an old Italian guy who wants to tell you all about leatherworking. I'm like, that's awesome. We're totally going to have a tour of your leatherworking facility. <laughs> we have other tours, uh, field trips lined up uh, with uh, potentially coffee roasting and some other fun stuff. Uh, the Nerd Night Madison boss, Lee Bishop, uh, is going to be running those. It's a lot of fun. Go to that long ass URL, sign up now. It's going to sell, it's going to be crazy. <laughs> with that plug out of the way, uh, I'm happy to introduce our next speaker, Matt Lewin. Uh, Matt's going to be talking to us about snake bites and carrying them. Another nice thing about this gig is that there are a lot of awesome resources in the Bay Area, one of which is Atlas Obscura. It tells you about all the places you want to visit, in this case, perhaps not. Uh, snake Island is off the coast of Brazil. Uh, it is so named because there are between three and five snakes per square meter of the island. <laughs> <laughs> leading leading uh, one researcher to say, on Snake Island, you're always three feet away from death. <laughs> and to the Brazilian Navy quarantining the island. Uh, Matt's going to tell us about one potential way we will treat snake bite in the future, which is really nice because the way we have treated in the past isn't so fantastic. Uh, I'm sure many people uh, remember the clusterfuck that came after 9-11. Our airspace closed down. Except for the one plane, which carried anti-venom to a hospital, and it was, of course, escorted by nice jets. That's still better than this guy, Bill Host. Some people apparently are Bill Host fans. He lived to be 100 years old, which is pretty awesome, considering he had 173 snake bites over his life. He actually injected himself with, anti uh, with uh, snake venom every day for about 60 years. Uh, so, tough motherfucker, almost as tough as this guy, Valentin Gamaldo. Uh, Valentin got bit by a, a coral snake in Texas. Coral snakes are vicious. Um, many of you may remember like the Boy Scout poem about yellow on red or red on black or something. I don't know. But you don't want to be bit by a coral snake. Um, but when this guy got bit by a coral snake, he bit off the head of the coral snake, skinned it, and then formed a tourniquet from the snake's skin. His, his, his brother kept the head as like a souvenir. Um, as, as if I needed this warning now, um, we, we do often like, we, we, ha we often have like a kitten or bunny, the covering its eyes is like a warning for like adult content. We schedule 
talks like these late at night. Uh, obviously, you're going to soon see pictures of snake bites or kind of gruesome. Um, however, it's a really big problem and one that Matt is helping to address. So, uh, everyone, welcome Matt to the stage. Matt Lewin, I'm one of the, uh, the expedition doctors for expedition physician for the uh, California Academy of Sciences. And uh, it's going to spend a couple of minutes. Oh, right up to your chin. I will hold the bike right up to my chin. Okay, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes just describing my basic job, which is to work as an expedition physician. Um, parasites are sometimes a problem, mostly in returning uh, expeditioners. And um, and getting people ready for expeditions, and and, and really what uh, a lot of what I do is just emergency medicine or applying what I learned as an emergency physician to travel and exploration medicine. I have no idea what my talk is called, uh, but one of the things you have to think about is that trauma is your biggest problem on expeditions. This is really what I think about a lot. How am I going to get my expeditions ready for trauma for environmental emergencies? Uh, we've had uh, rollover in Patagonia, we have potholes in Ulaanbaatar, people are taking the, the manhole covers and selling them for scrap metal at the Chinese border, and there are no street lights, and we had one guy just plummet into a, a manhole, and so had it. that's some other pictures of him draining a broken, dra draining the blood out of an elbow, but his expedition's over, he's got a broken elbow. Um, there are places that we work with uh, former, current or former areas of political unrest and unexploded munitions. You can see Dr. Clark has her GPS in case she gets blown into orbit. She will find her way back to camp. But what's going on here? Anybody? There's, we're in the middle of the Gobi Desert and we're driving down the road and there's water chasing us. What's going on? Who said that? Who said that? He did. Hi. All right. Well, I have some door prizes. <laughs> Somebody will distribute these tickets. Two of these are for uh, general admission, and two are for nightlife. Okay. Uh, so the, the answer, the question was, what is going on here? And sorry. Oops. Shoot. All right, well, that was a flash flood. There, the next picture that should have come up there is a picture of the entire plane completely covered in water, and then the third picture was a tornado. Um, oh, and, and, and so that's some kind of stuff that we have. Uh, 2005, we're working in, uh, in uh, Ica, Peru. Next year was the Paracas earthquake. You're really subject to the, uh, the vagaries of the weather and, uh, and the environment. This is. Just to illustrate, I actually spend a lot of time treating people who are not on the expedition. They'll either come into the camp if they seeking medical care. Uh, this is a, a patient that I treated in Mongolia. He had a, he was septic. He had a blood he had a blood infection from a wound, and I think we're actually going quite well. But I I had switched him from IV antibiotics to oral antibiotics, and then he had a, a life threatening allergic reaction. Not the easy kind to treat, which would be anaphylactic shock. You treat it, you're done. But uh, he had actually a Stevens-Johnson syndrome, which is like a burn. You have to treat it like a burn. So the, the take-home lesson is that if you're going to treat people in the field, you have to be able to finish the job. And we haven't. We were there. We were, we were there for a couple of weeks. So I had a, a week of burn care um, in the Gobi Desert. Uh, let's see more trauma. This fellow, oh, he was the recipient of a machete. His colleague, his buddy, threw a machete to him, and he caught it with his hand Whoa. by the blade. Uh, some more minor trauma. Uh, let's see, Booty Booty Island. Nowadays, we have iPhones. One of the uh, one of the field scientists cut her leg in the hold of the ship, and here they are iPhoning me from Booty Booty Island off the coast of New Guinea, and I'm talking Dr. Jack Numbacher through the stapling procedure. And finally, um, a not so a not so uh, inspiring case, which is which is really terrible. Is this, uh, this is a fellow that worked uh, on one of the academy expeditions as a as a local field hand? He's got necrotizing stoma stomatitis, untreated. This is 100% fatal. Um, described in the era of Hippocrates, and so oftentimes you can't do anything. This this is a surgical problem. 
there's no place in Madagascar where this operation can be performed. Just saying, uh, the main thing I was saying, mostly uh, what we see on the way on returning explorers in malaria, probably the top four. In the last few years, we've had cases of nathostomiasis, leishmaniasis, a lot of malaria. Um, oftentimes, we just have no idea what's going on, so I guess how to treat it. Um, and so that's mostly what I do. Uh, get people ready or, or treat problems as they as they arise. A few years ago, I was on expedition to the Philippines, and we were in an area which has neurotoxic snakes, which are cobras and crates primarily in, in that area. And, it, and, it, and about ten years earlier, one of our scientists had died from snake bite in the field, and so I was very worried about this. And so I, I was thinking about this problem, and, and that's the origin of this project, which is the uh, search for the universal uh, antidote to snake bite. These are illustrations of the big four snakes that kill in India, crate, cobra, uh, saw-scaled viper, and a Russell's viper. And they kill differently. Crate is a purely neurotoxic snake. Cobra, meaning that it kills by paralysis. So it bites the victim, the, para the, the victim becomes weak, and then stops breathing, because we know that the Achilles heel of vertebrate life is respiration. If you can't breathe, you die. Um, these other snakes will kill, this one will cause bleeding and clotting. A drop of venom from this snake will cause virtually all the blood in your body just to clot. And you'll, you'll die, you know, an angry bite. You'll die in minutes. If it's not an angry bite, you might die in hours. Uh, and this is a really, really nasty snake. The Russell's viper, it hangs out in cane fields. And you have to leave cane fields alone for six or eight months. Snakes breed, they get all in there and then people come in to cut the cane and they get bitten. Russell's viper in southern India kills by a combination of paralysis, bleeding, and clotting. And in northern India it kills just by causing bleeding and clotting alone. Um, so kind of a theme here that the snake's basic weapons are snakes, the snakes that kill quickly kill you know, basically just by a few mechanisms. They either paralyze you or they cause bleeding and clotting. So that's the a little bit of the oops, that's the answer. All right, the question is, yeah. for the door, for the big door rises, what is the difference between venom and poison? I saw that in first. Well, I already got it. You got it. <laughs> but I do know the answer. Sorry, I, I, I can't be the referee for this. Balcony! Balcony! Uh, a poison is if you eat it, you become ill or die. A venom is what it's injected into. Excellent. So, okay. a non-venomous snake. Uh, yeah. I, need a, I need somebody to deliver this. Uh, so the, the the question is, what is the difference between venom and poison? If you leave no, if you leave with no other bit of information from this talk, the difference between venom and poison is that venoms are a subset of poisons that must be injected. Poisons are generally ingested; they're put on the skin. Uh, how does the snake cause bleeding and clotting at the same time? We'll get there. Good question. So the question is, how do snakes cause bleeding and clotting at the same time? We will, we will get there, I think. So, some sort of poison that are injected. Just, just to give you another feel for what happens on expedition, uh, reaching into a lot of places you can't see is, is uh, excavating a, 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 some, a titanosaur in, in Patagonia. You can see this little snake right there. So wear, wear proper footwear. Um, snake bite is a global problem. I actually wasn't really aware of this until I started researching this problem, that uh, snake bite is a, really a, a global epidemic. And during the monsoon, probably 10,000 people a month die in India. So about 800 million people in India who are at risk living in the countryside. And uh, there are about a million bites a year. And in India, about 50,000 to 60,000 deaths during the five months of the monsoon. It's a disease of poverty. 98% of the people who die from snake bites uh, are living in poverty. We don't really hear about it. In the United States, we're North America, we're really privileged. We have five, six deaths a year in a bad year. And so we don't really think about snake bites. Where, where else do we send our kids out to play? We don't pay attention. We have to go out and play. You don't think about, you don't worry about venomous snakes. So um, that's, that's the main point of this. The, the, this the, this is actually a, a band practice, which is training training snake charmers from a young age. This is a child who's been bitten by 
uh, almost certainly a crate or a cobra. He's got the broken neck sign. He's so weak he cannot lift his head. So he just, he just pops, sits backwards because uh, it's so weak. And uh, as it turns out, antivenoms don't work against paralytic venoms. Um, the way that the patients survive is they get to the hospital. If they're the percentage of patients that get to the hospital in time, they'll be treated with, with mechanical ventilation. It's been known since the 1870s that if you just breathe for the patient for several days or several weeks, in some cases, that they will turn around and breathe. Uh, what am I doing here? So a couple more bit of perspective. Um, Landmines kill 25 to 3,500 people a year. Snake bites 20, 10 to 20 times that many. So, but uh, USAID and Gates and WHO, zero dollars for snake bite research. Landmines get about $700 million a year still. Uh, this is another child with the broken neck sign. It's a very stereotypical syndrome. The, the most common places where snake bites are, are prevalent are in Sub-Saharan Africa, India, and, and Southeast Asia. So this, is, uh, this is actually the picture that inspired my, uh, the research project. It's really captured my attention. I've published on a bunch of different subjects. I, my mentors always criticize, crit, critique my uh, prognosis as, a, as an academic that's poor because I'm too promiscuous. I like this, I go from this idea to this idea. I've published on about 20 different subjects, but this project has really gripped me for the last few years and it will probably be my, uh, my main project for the next decade. Uh, I was explaining my homemade anti-paralytic snake bite kit to one of the, the uh, herpetologists as I was leaving the expedition. I was explaining, oh, because your eyes will get weak if you get bitten, and, and then the, the bigger muscles will get weak, so your eyes will get weak, and then your tongue will get heavy, and then you're going to lift your neck, and then you can't breathe. And I was um, falling asleep on the airplane when I, I looked, was looking at this picture, and I thought, oh, I wonder if this, if this is a better way. What if you could just do this as a nasal sprayer, or just get rid of the needle? And so that idea stuck in my head for a long time. As it turns out, this drug, neostigmine, which has been known to reverse paralysis from cobras and crates since the 1970s, can be administered through the nose. Um, so, so I guess that's, the, that's really the punchline. But that, the, uh, the way I was thinking about this problem is what would a, a solution look like? Antivenoms are... are they require refrigeration and so they're very expensive. You have to have, you take venom to make antivenom from snake spit. It's really kind of weird. It's 2014. You can dictate a message into your iPhone and send it to your friend in the, in the, um, in the upstairs of the theater. But we still have to milk a snake to get the venom. And then inject that into a horse or a sheep and then extract the serum and dry the serum and find out which parts of that serum are active against the snake that you're thinking about and then put it into 20 or 30 bottles that will be required to treat the snake bite at extreme expense and 80% of those patients will have an allergic reaction to the venom because when you inject a horse or a sheep into somebody, the immune system doesn't like it. Um, so, so my idea was to take something like neostigmine, which we've known about since for 80 years, it's been around and uh, see if we could get that through the nose. Um, it's heat stable, it's dirt cheap, and, uh, and uh, potentially useful. So I wasn't getting any funding for this. It was quite hard to get this funded. And so I was expressing my frustration to my colleague at UCSF. I've got this idea, I've got the basic invention. I can't just hide behind a bush in Indian wafers for to get bitten and leap out with my neostigmine. <laughs> and, uh, and treat them. I'm, I'm not quite willing to get envenomed to test it. <laughs> and, uh, and Phil says, hey, we could just paralyze you. And so, uh, actually, one of, my, one of my colleagues who helped in that is up in the... I'm, still, I'm here to tell the tale. There's Dr. Lance Montauk, um, who, uh, among his important roles during the experiment I'm about to describe was keeping me from being petrified by fear. Uh, in this experiment, uh, the, 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 the experiment is, is, was quite clever, and Phil was so casual about this. Hey, we'll just paralyze you. But it turns out that neostigmine, which is a, this drug that I'm describing, I won't go into too much detail, but uh, Mary Walker first used it in 1935 to treat a paralyzing neurological disease. Um, and 
this drug became the basis for the treatment of, of a, a disease called myasthenia gravis, which is, is uh, not rare but not common. And um, and uh, it turns out it w the mechanism by which this disease paralyzes people is the same as Cobravan. Nice. And so, uh, it, in fact, the, the story really goes back over 140 years. In, in the 1870s, this fellow, Sir Joseph Ferrer, who was in the Indian Medical Service, realized that cobra venom works the same way as curare, which is a South American plant toxin. And he thought that they behave exactly the same way, which is really remarkable. He didn't have the internet. He had to know pharmacology oh. from, the, from, from South America. He was working in India. But he actually did experiments demonstrating the progression of paralysis between curare and, 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 um, and cobra venom was exactly the same. And then in 1935, as I said, Mary Walker treated myasthenia gravis. And then in the 1940s and 50s, uh, people were using curare to paralyze patients in the operating room. And sometimes the curare didn't wear off. And then somebody said, well, we'll try neostigmine to reverse paralysis. And that is how neostigmine became a, a drug that is now used two or th 300 million times a year in operating rooms all over the world. It's very inexpensive. It's it's uh, very well understood. Um, kind of extending this story, in 1970s, uh, Banerjee in India treated a crate bite and a cobra bite, two separate patients, using neostigmine intravenously in a hospital. Now the drug is a little bit complicated intravenously, because, and and then uh, and then in the 70s, people realized they figured out how myasthenia gravis works with cobra venom. And then in the 1990s, people were experimenting with shooting neostigmine up myasthenia patients' noses and reversing their symptoms. And so that actually my, my search to figure out how, if this could work or not work after I had this idea was not very long because the literature was already there. And so we convinced completely kosher the UCSF uh, ethics committee to let them paralyze a healthy human volunteer. Um, <laughs> And, and we published this paper, which was a uh, reversal of experimental paralysis in, uh, in a human using a nasal spray suggests an approach to the treatment of snake bite. Now, this alone doesn't really cover all the snakes that would, would, uh, would kill you, but it suggests an approach that's a little bit different than the standard approach. And so in this experiment, we uh, used clinical parameters to, to sh demonstrate the uh, progression of paralysis this is time on this axis in minutes and then these are different clinical parameters such as the ability to see as I got more paralyzed I couldn't see I could just could barely see the hands waving and then I can't swallow and then I can't lift my neck down here and then uh, and that's having a little bit of difficult time breathing while uh, while um, my anesthesia colleagues were casually debating the, whether Hank Williams Jr. or Hank Williams Sr. was the better country singer. Um, but Dr. Montauk never left my side. <laughs> I said, hey, why don't we give him the drug? I think he's ready. And so, uh, and so, so, and so it was. Um, part of the part of the worry about using just clinical parameters is you worry that people will evaluate this. Oh, it's just like a, a trick in a in a uh, a televangelist thing. Oh, get up and you rise from the bed. So you can say that from after I had a stable paralysis, we gave the drug, and then and then it all it all reversed. Now we didn't use venom. We used the same basic drug as they use in the, in the operating room, which is a curare derivative to, to establish a stable paralysis. This, this was the most painful part of the experiment to prove that it could not cheat. We attached an electrode to my thumb. It was shocking my thumb every four seconds for two hours. And as the paralysis set in, the thumb can't flick against the shock of the electrode. And then as the, as the strength returns, it would, it would return. And so, but just, that was that. So, there you have it. Uh, oh, I didn't even, I'm sorry, I didn't even know there was a, a clear picture. I did not remember that there was a clear picture. So this is, this is the basic thing. Getting weak, getting strong in between nasal neostigmine. It's just administered as a nasal spray. 
This is uh, after we did the experiment on me. We got a little bit of money to do the experiment on mice. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping this... I'm hoping this... Uh, my parents' reaction to this was, you're a schmuck. Uh, and so... Uh, but... Um, and I, I'm hoping this gives me some immunity from PETA in the future because I've promised my parents I will never try a stunt like this again. Uh, but just to give you an idea of what, what we did, we, we gave high-dose cobra venom to mice and, uh, and then, and then uh, treated them several minutes later with, uh, with neostigmine and 100% of those mice outlived controls, of which 100% died. And 10 out of, 10 out of the 15 uh, mice that got intranasal neostigmine survived and were completely normal. Um, a few months ago, I was, I was, t I'm going to be completely candid because I'm just that way. Um, I was writing an email to the Gates Foundation for the 200th time saying, come on guys, this is what, you know, they get billions of worthy causes being uh, solicited and and they, and they have to make some decisions. They haven't responded what? to uh, to this in in the way that I would like, which is to put out a, a innovations challenge, whether it's my idea or somebody else's. And I, they have a new director of of uh, the Gates Foundation, and I, nobody would give me her email. And so, in a moment of frustration, I sent it to the New York Times, nice. and they said, "Well, that would be a great editorial." <laughs> And so this is the this is what the uh, the editorial looked like. But it really it started off as an email, and uh, and then uh, the they said, oh, you're gonna love the art. We're not gonna show it to you. It's a surprise. It's really it's really striking. And I and actually I, I, I was I, I was genuinely surprised. I was relieved. I was relieved that it was a cobra, which is a, paral a paralyzing snake. But I, I think that this 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 woman does not look like one of the 98 percent of the usual victims in poverty. She looks. She looks as if she just walked out of the New Yorker. And, uh, but a lot of people read this. We got a very nice response, and, and so, and so I'm just gonna. I'm gonna actually just really keep things short. Um, I do often wonder why every uh, medical, virtually every medical society has has. Uh, the snake on its staff, and we have no idea. We have no good treatment. There is no good field treatment for snake bite. You cannot give antivenom in the field. It is too dangerous. It is too expensive. You have to get the right antivenom. If you're in southern India, it's great because the antivenom for Russell's viper is made in southern India, but if you're in northern India, it's not going to work because the snakes are a little bit different. The outside coatings of these venoms are a little bit different from season to season, from region to region, and so. So the fundamental mechanisms on the inside are basically the same. The snake kills you by paralysis. It's going to be one of two of these salivary enzymes. If it kills you by bleeding, it's going to be a variation of one of the two paralytic enzymes. Um, same basic enzyme. It's got the same inside. It has a little bit different outside. And then there are the, the enzymes that cause tissue destruction. So probably there are only four or five really fundamental mechanisms that can cause death. And all of them can be inhibited by small molecules that can be absorbed, that can be dissolved in water, and um, and are probably inexpensive and probably heat stable. And I think the the basic thing is whether the nasal spray is the way to go, or an EpiPen for snake bite, or an eye drop, or a sublingual lozenge, or I, I don't know, um, a suppository. I don't know. Um, I, the answer is I don't know, but I, I think we've been successful in changing the way people think about the problem, which, to, which is to me is a, a satisfying outcome, irrespective of whether this project or somebody else's like it uh, pans out. The real, the, one of the real reasons to go on expedition is every so often you'll be hanging out in the field and you will find a dinosaur egg with an embryo in it. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll take questions. Academy had had more money dedicated to that combined 
research project, they could have brought a smart person like you along with them, and then they could have also paid the Burmese military to netted that guy out of there. Um, wasn't like money, like what partly, like, uh, or lack of money prevented him from being saved in some ways? So the question is, is was, it, was, it, was it money that prevented Dr. Slowinski from being saved? Um, the answer is not number one, I wasn't there, so I don't know the details. I think there were a lot of things that go into, went into this from what I understand. There's a lot of bad luck. 9-11 happened that day. There was no way that they had no communication. They didn't know about 9-11. Um, it's not clear that anti-venom would have worked. Oh, I see. I don't understand how so, the guy attacked so. Okay, so, so I, the answer is I don't know exactly either, and, and I'm a little bit reluctant to discuss publicly what I do know or don't know. But I, I think that for the most part, it was there was a lot of bad luck involved. Um, they were very, very far from. I think I think in a lot of ways it was a lot like the people that die from snake bite. They're hours and hours away from care. If you're in India, which we have a, a nearly a billion people at risk on top of a billion snakes. It's still an average of six hours to get to the hospital for, for these people. The other thing is it's really expensive. Um, and, and so if you're bitten and there's only a 3% chance that that's going to be a lethal bite, are you willing to risk six or eight years of your family's income to get treatment that probably doesn't make a difference just on that? So it's, a, it's a, almost, it's a, you're making a huge decision to get treated when you don't even know if the snake bite is, is going to be a lethal one. So people go to traditional healers, by the time they get symptoms, now it's too late to get to the hospital. So we're, we're trying to come up with, instead of a three years income solution, a three days income type solution. Um, I, think, I think I answered the question I wished you asked. But <laughs> we'll move on. Thank you. It's a fair question. I, I just don't know the answer. You said that people both bleed out and it's a coagulating uh, blood. How do you get both at the same time? So, so the question is, is how can venom create bleeding and clotting and paralysis at the same time? So the, all the venoms are derived from saliva. These are salivary glands and they're different types of enzymes. Um, and so for one thing, the venoms are complex mixtures. There's not just one flavor of thing in the spit. It's got maybe have a paralytic enzyme. It might have a digestive enzyme. Uh, it might have something that causes bleeding or clotting. Part of what will decide what happens is, as I said, regional or small genetic difference in the outsides of the antivenom of, of the venom rather, which will dictate whether it ends up in a nerve or ends up in the bloodstream. But the but the the fundamental core of these enzymes will be, will be very similar. Um, so for example, um, crate venom has a very high activity of an enzyme called phospholipase. And when that phospholipase attacks a nerve, it, it destroys the nerve eventually, um, or inhibits the release of, of neurotransmitters, and that will cause paralysis. But in the blood, it will cause clotting or derangements of, of clotting and bleeding, which might occur simultaneously, such as we see with patients who have who have too much consumption of the blood clotting components from diseases like septic shock. And the venoms will promote these abnormal cycles, but the, but the, the basic enzyme is the same on the inside. So, so that, that's why I think that the, the approach could be that instead of generating antibodies to venoms, so the, the anti-venom is an antibody made by horses or sheep to the outside of the venom. We should be trying to find ways to find the, the lowest common denominator of what's on the inside of these venoms. It's really only going to be a few enzymes, um, it is my prediction. Are there nasal, okay, are there nasal and venoms that will work against So the question is, is, do we have a do we have agents that will work against the bleeding and clotting disorders induced by venoms in nasal spray form? And the answer is, we have some candidates. But even even the even the antiparalytic uh, is is really we're embryo you know it's embryonic experiments we've done in one human and a few mice, but we're we're getting funding now to test a, a wider variety. So these are really proof of principle experiments. I wouldn't consider them to be proof of anything, um, but we'll hope to get there. Two more questions. 
I'm gonna let you call. Uh, <laughs> you had your hand up. What can we do with the, we have the fewest fights, but I think we have a lot more money than other countries, so what can we do to help? The question is, what can you do to help? The good question. The, 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 um, I'd say it's been, the philanthropic route has been really difficult. Um, I think just keeping the ball in the air, be aware of it, and if you if you find somebody interested in funding the research, I'd be delighted to know about it. Uh, but I think I think the the main thing is awareness. Um, I think in a way, to me, this is a problem, a, a governmental problem. For example, the Indian government subsidizes the production of anti venom, which is incredibly expensive. It's a high dollar industry, and so maybe some of that some money should be going to to coming up with. With uh, with alternative solutions, it, it, the solution doesn't. I don't think it needs to come from here, or from from me, or or it doesn't really matter where it comes from. But I think that the the, the place where it should come from is we're most likely to have success would be someplace like India, where lots of fantastic chemists and lots of candidate compounds and and a billion people on top of a billion snakes. It's much easier to test it than here. So. Yes. Um, first, I would just like to say that you've given me a newfound respect for what one has to do to be first author on a paper. <laughs> I hope I never have to go to those lengths. Um, a number of the examples you've used are um, snakes in uh, in India, uh, venom globally, venom, you know, venomous snakes in Australia, say, or in the Americas or Africa. What are, are there a lot? Is there a lot of diversity in the functionality of the venoms, or you know, would a, would a, a, uh, are the are they the same issues? Are the, uh, the, the venom does venom work the same way in venomous snakes in other parts of the world? So the, the question is, do do venoms work by the same basic me mechanisms whether you're in Australia or the southern U.S. and rooting around for coral snakes? Um, the answer is yes. I mean, the, the the coral snake venom is very susceptible to neostigmine. Um, so so for example, the, the the basic again the basic enzymes are the same on the inside. That, that What makes them active is the same. Now Australia is a great place to test what we've got so far because all the snakes in Australia are killed by paralysis. And so that would be a great place to, to try something like this. And, and, and maybe the place to try it is in animal husbandry. A lot of dog, a lot of veterinary cases. So I, I guess to answer your question, what can we do in the United States? I think the way to do it would be test it in, in dogs. There are a lot of dog bites in the southern United States. Yeah. Um, I don't know about cats, but dogs dogs get bitten by uh, by uh, coral snakes pretty frequently in the south. So something like that. So maybe maybe in the in the animal husbandry is the way to try it. Uh, thanks to Matt. If you have any last <laughs> questions uh, for him, he'll. Yeah, yeah, he'll he'll be uh, in the lobby. I did want to give one last sort of administrative plug. Uh, first of all, uh, there's a whole mess of nerd nights coming up. Apparently, uh, our uh, brothers and sisters in the uh, North Bay and San Francisco, you'll notice that we aren't on the list. Uh, we're actually off next month. I was expecting more of an awe, but that's that's. that's, that's I'll just say odd to myself that no one odd. Um, the reason we're off is that we're uh, going to great lengths to help out with the uh, block party, which is right before us. So go to that site, sign up. It's going to be awesome. Um, you could pay anywhere from free to like 15 bucks, depending on what you want to do. It's going to be great. Uh, Kelly Plug Bawfest, we just opened up sales of our $10 balcony seats. Uh, they're going to go really fast because people like Matt and Min are tweeting about it. Uh, the people that are going to be right here in this theater instead of us next month are Basics, the Bay Area Art Science Interdisciplinary Collaborative Sessions. Um, they're phenomenal. I saw their show in San Francisco and I'm really looking forward to seeing it here. Um, so come out. Kelly is also going to be at Creatures of the Nightlife at the Cal Academy, along with a lot of other cool content. She's giving a talk and having another sign sort of thing. Um, you should also just check out the Cal Academy because they have a great skulls exhibit that you can read more about in the back. 
when you give like one last wave to the librarian and sign up on our email list and all that stuff. But we will be back in November. Uh, that's the Monday before Thanksgiving. I know it's hard, but the lineup is fucking awesome. Uh, Aaron Brandt is the most passionate person about spiders I know ever, and I'm really, really glad to get her. Serena Agnew uh, was a suggestion from a past Night night speaker. She's a neuroscientist, it's great. And then uh, Chris Nissell, uh wrote a book about science fiction interfaces, and he picked a particularly salacious talk that has sex in the title twice. So it's gonna be <laughs> awesome. Uh, so I look forward to seeing most of you at the block party and the rest of you here in uh, November. Thanks, have a good night.